And this is Dr. Stan here on Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay, and bringing you the story behind the story, the news behind the news, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at and illusion is usually king. But in the battle for survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine just what the future will bring. Now, we need to remind you that uh, the views that are expressed here are not those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of uh, uh, KFER. They're my views, the views of our guests, the views of our callers. And furthermore, uh, we need to remind you that <laughs> uh, we are listener-supported, and we certainly uh, need your financial support uh, to keep bringing you the message of freedom here on Radio Liberty. If you'd like a copy of any of the tapes of our programs, they're available. And, of course, uh, uh, we'll be glad to give you one for nothing. But if you could include a gift of $6.50 to cover the uh, our costs, why, we'd appreciate it. Otherwise, certainly write to us at Post Office Box 13 in Santa Cruz, 95063. That's Post Office Box 13 in Santa Cruz, 95063. And uh, so, uh, without further ado, I want to give you a little background uh, on a very interesting subject, which I think is vitally important that every American understand about. And that is the subject of America's great tax-exempt foundations. Now, uh, it was back in 1950 when America had just completed the Second World War. We'd lost hundreds of thousands of men killed and hundreds of thousands of uh, men uh, crippled. But America had won the war. We had won the war to make the world free and to bring the four freedoms to the peoples of the world. But suddenly by 1950, people began to look around. Eastern Europe had gone communist. Uh, China had fallen to communism. And the uh, terrible trials and liquidation had already begun at that point in China. And it was obvious that something was seriously wrong. How had this happened? Hadn't we fought the war to bring freedom to the peoples of the world? Well, the, the Senate of the United States commissioned a, uh, a congressional committee uh, to look into the background of what actually transpired at that time. What they found was basically this, that the Chinese communists under General Chiang Kai-shek uh, had essentially won the war in China. Uh, the communists were in, uh, in retreat into northern China, and it was only going to be a matter of time uh, before the nationalist Chinese government was victorious. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek had already committed to forming a democratic form of government, and now there was going to be an opportunity to bring freedom to China for the first time in 20 years. They had been in war for 20 years. When the American State Department decided that that wasn't what we wanted, basically the American State Department demanded that Chiang Kai-shek form a coalition government with the Chinese communists. Well, Chiang Kai-shek had actually been trained as a communist in Moscow. He understood communism and he understood you couldn't, treat, you couldn't trust them and the last thing in the world he wanted was to have communists in his government. And so he refused. At that point, the American State Department put an arms embargo on China. And basically, Chiang Kai-shek had bought weapons uh, and actually paid for them. They were in Okinawa, other Pacific Islands. The American State Department saw that he was unable to get the weapons he had already bought and purchased. His efforts to buy and purchase weapons anywhere else in the world were effectively blocked by the American State Department. The Congress of the United States voted $125 million in, in weapons to be sent to Chiang Kai-shek, and the ships were kept in the harbor in San Francisco for a, many, a matter of many months. And actually, when the weapons finally arrived in China and the rifles got to northern uh, China, the, the rifles didn't have any bolts in them and were useless. Now, the majority or many of the uh, Chinese divisions were equipped with American weapons, and once the supply of, of guns and ammunition were cut off, they had nothing to fight with. Chiang Kai-shek had a massive army, but without weapons, it was defeated by a small, well-armed Chinese communist force, which simply ran south uh, uh, as the Chinese were in retreat because they had absolutely nothing to fight with. How would you like to be a soldier in the battlefield without any ammunition, without any hand grenades, uh, without any replacement if you lost your rifle. And that's exactly what happened. Well, of course, it, it really didn't make sense. Uh, basically, uh, it was pointed out, and in the McCarran Committee reports, uh, the Senate uh, Committee, uh, headed by Senator Pat McCarran, uh, pointed out that the Chinese communists were well-equipped. They had equipment that we had given them, given to the Russians, that American equipment given to the Russians, the Russians turned over to the Chinese communists, and, of course, the massive amounts of armaments that the uh, Japanese had surrendered 
to the Russians when uh, the Russians moved into Manchuria. All of this was given to the Chinese communists. They had no problems with military supplies. We actually de, de facto disarmed the Chinese communist forces. And as a result of that, China fell to communism. As a direct result of that, between 60 and 80 million human beings were systematically liquidated in China. Now, you know, when you use a figure like that, it just isn't real. Uh, you know, we, we, we speak with horror of what happened in the, uh, in the extermination camps of, of Europe, where six million Jews were uh, executed. But when was the last time you heard about the 60 to 80 million Chinese, helpless Chinese civilians who were just liquidated to create a state of terror to allow a consolidation of power by the Chinese Communist government that America brought to be? Well, anyway, after the Senate... Uh, a committee reports. And incidentally, for those of you who are out there skeptical and would like to see a copy of this summary of this report, you send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Post Office Box 13 in Santa Cruz, 95063. We'll Xerox off a copy of the two pages of the summary of the McCarran Committee report, which incidentally nobody ever read because this material was effectively suppressed by the controlled media even back in 1950 and 1951 in America. So if you'd like to get a copy to document to find out if this is really true, why send us a copy, a self-addressed stamped envelope, Post Office Box 13 in Santa Cruz, 95063. And so it was after the McCarran Committee report uh, was submitted, uh, people began to read it, and they found out that there was an organization in the United States which had been specifically designed to use as a propaganda tool for the communists. It, it had a thrust, and basically it was talked about the corruption with the Chinese Communist government, and then it talked about uh, uh, Mao and Zhou Enlai as if they were somehow the Abraham Lincoln, the George Washington of, of China. They weren't really communists, they were simply agrarian reformers. And by a carefully coordinated propaganda campaign, they were able to convince many people in the United States that uh, the Chinese communists were not communists at all. Uh, just as a, a decade later, they were able to convince the American people that Fidel Castro really wasn't a communist. He was the Abraham Lincoln uh, of the Sierra Mastre. Well, basically, the interesting thing about the Institute of Pacific Relations was that, that as they began to look into its background, it had been financed by, of all things, the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation? Uh, uh, so actually, uh, financing a subversive organization? Well, when this information came out, uh, the members of the Congress and the Senate uh, demanded another investigation, and that was to investigate the great tax exempt foundations to determine what their real agenda was. Did they have some hidden or some subversive agenda? Well, of course, the 82nd Congress appointed uh, the something uh, a committee that came to be known as the Cox Committee. It was headed by Congressman E.E. E. Cox of Georgia, and its purpose was to investigate the great tax exempt foundations. Now, on that committee was a Republican. His name was B. Carroll Reese, Congressman Reese of Tennessee. Well, of course, as so often happens, immediately the media began attacking this committee. And then, uh, it maybe it had just been a coincidence, but Congressman Cox uh, suddenly died. And that, of course, was the end of the committee. Well, in 1953, uh, the uh, 83rd Congress convened. This was a Republican Congress. And they then called for the uh, uh, production, uh, for the... Uh, 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 authorization of another uh, congressional committee. This came to be known as the Co Reese Committee, headed by Congressman B. Carroll Reese. And its specific purpose was to investigate the great tax-exempt foundations. Well, uh, in the foreword to a book written about this committee, Congressman Reese said this, but it was the function of our investigation to find out to what extent, if any, are the funds of the large foundations aiding and abetting Marxist tendencies in the United States and weakening the love which every American should have for his way of life? And then he goes on to say, um, so we set out to find the answers. We wanted to explore the problems of foundations by examining their actions, not their statements for the public. We felt that they are involved in the concepts under which foundations operate and grew in the United States as certain inherent dangers for the public welfare. We were not blind to the undoubted merits of the contributions of the numerous tax exam foundations to worthwhile causes, but it was our intention to find out the factual basis for preserving their constructive function and at the same time for supplying guidance for future legislation and administrative action against the use of foundation power for political ends. 
The story of that adventure, of what we found, and of the harassment to which we were subjected is included in this book by Rennie Warmser, Foundations, Their Power and Influence. Well, let me tell you what happened to the committee. First of all, uh, tremendous pressure was brought to bear in, on individual members of Congress uh, who were on the committee to force them to stop the investigation. Pressure was brought to bear on other members of Congress to cut off appropriations for this uh, investigation. The committee was routinely attacked by the New York Times and the Washington Post Tribune and by all the major conservative and liberal media in America. Uh, amazingly, a congressman named Wayne Hayes uh, was appointed, and Wayne Hayes came from Indiana, and his specific function on the committee was to disrupt its, its hearings. In fact, uh, on, uh, it, it's told, the story is told in the book, and everything I'm telling you can be found almost in this uh, book entitled Foundations, Their Power and Influence, which I strongly recommend to you. Uh, but Congressman Wayne Hayes, during one 185-minute period, interrupted the hearings 235 times. Why? because he wanted to disrupt the hearings. They did not want the hearings to take place. Uh, basically, of course, as the uh, committee uh, uh, proceeded with its investigation under the direction of Congressman B. Carroll Reese, under the direction of the chief counsel, Rene Warmser, and under the uh, guidance of the director of research, a man named Norman Dodd, who you're going to hear from later in this tape, uh, they, they began to uncover incredible things. And, of course, one of the first things was that the great foundations were being used to change America. They were being used to change us from a free society into a socialist society into a fascist society. They were being used to change America from a sovereign nation into simply one more state in a new world order, into a new world government. Uh, they talk on page 204 of the book about the investigations uh, into what the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, had done. And basically, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace had been endowed specifically to bring about world peace. Now, how do you bring about world peace? Well, they decided they had a great idea. They'd bring about war. And uh, on page 204 of the book, they tell about how Nicholas Murray Butler, who uh, was the longtime president of Columbia University, a uh, Republican candidate for the presidency at one time, uh, he, he was well rewarded for his loyalty to the, uh, uh, the people who worked behind the scenes manipulating the great foundations. But Nicholas Murray Butler was the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And here's what the uh, uh, book tells you. When Andrew Carnegie established the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, he gave the managers of his fund a difficult task. How were they to go about promoting peace? They seemed to have not a very clear idea until, until Dr. Nicholas Murray Butler, in whose hands Mr. Carnegie put the initial direction of the fund, got excited about the perils of the Allies in World War I and decided that the best way to establish peace was to help get the United States into the war. Let me repeat that. He decided that the best way to establish peace was to help to get the United States into the war. And to this end, he began to use the endowment funds. And that's what they did. They used the endowment funds to propagandize the American people to get involved in a war that wasn't our business at all. And working along with uh, uh, the Morgan, uh, uh, J.P. Morgan banking interests and Thomas Lamont and others uh, working behind the scenes, they created a propaganda campaign in America designed for one and only one purpose, and that was to bring America into World War I where we in, uh, suffered 126,000 American boys killed, 237,000 injured, many of them carrying the, uh, the pain of their wounds to their very graves. And what did we accomplish? Why, we were going to get the League of Nations. We were going to get world government. We were going to bring out world peace. And, of course, the League of Nations failed. And so once it had failed, they had to begin working for another war because wars are a means by which society has changed. Now, if that sounds like a, a ridiculous statement, I want you to listen to this tape very carefully, because you're going to hear in the second half of the tape an interview with uh, Norman Dodd, the director of research for this congressional committee, who had the unique opportunity uh, of being allowed to send one of his employees to go through the minutes of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. And, of course, what he found, what uh, the employee, her name was Catherine uh, Kaysen, as I remember, uh, uh, Casey, Catherine, uh, well, anyway, you'll hear about it, Catherine Casey. Uh, what she found what, going through the minutes of the committee was that in 1908, uh, the members of the uh, uh, board of the Carnegie Endowment were sitting around saying, how can we change the world? Is there any better way to change the world than to war? But how will we get a war going? And they spent many, many, many months deciding how to get a war going. And then, of course, after the war was going and 
uh, America was involved in the war and our boys were dying. They sat around in the minutes, and, and this is all recorded in the minutes, congratulating one another and saying, gee, we did a great job because we're already beginning to change society. Incredible. Well, this is the sort of thing you're not going to hear elsewhere, but you're going to hear a taped interview, which I did with Mr. Norman Dodd in 1980 before he died. I did it because I knew this story was so vitally important, and someday the time would come when the American people had to learn the truth. We have working within our society a cancer, a cancer that has an objective and goal, and that objective and goal is to destroy America as we've known it. Well, let me tell you what the great foundations have done with their money. And they decided that they were going to change the educational system. They began to finance John Dewey in progressive education. And, of course, that was simply a process of beginning to uh, take away phonics out of the schools, to dumb down our, ki our children so that they would be quite willing to go along with the oh, new wonderful socialist society that was planned. They went to the great universities. They bribed the universities uh, to put their people into key positions, the chairs of history and political science and economics, always pushing the socialist or collectivist agenda. Uh, they uh, financed the writing of textbooks, always slanted to the left. They financed the, uh, the publication of research books, always slanted to the left. They financed uh, such things as the Encyclopedia of Social Studies. The whole story is in the book, Foundations, Their Power and Influence, which is probably one of the three or four most important books ever written, actively suppressed and censored in America for many years and available only through Radio Liberty. So basically, uh, what, what transpired was that when they financed the writing of the Encyclopedia of Social Studies, they had a socialist write the section on socialism. Well, you'd think that'd be sort of prejudice, and he would glorify socialism, wouldn't you? And then they had a communist write the section on communism. Well, of course, the, he would be very prejudiced towards making it very apparent that communism was the best sort. But when it came to writing the section on capitalism and free enterprise, they also had a communist write that. And little wonder then that through successive generations, our universities have been slanted to the left. Uh, uh, they set out to reward those professors who would prostitute themselves and, and teach the liberal line, would write uh, articles uh, professing the liberal line. Uh, the, the, they actually bribed the academics, many of whom were underpaid, and felt that, you know, basically <clears throat> a ruling elite should really control what was going on. And so it wasn't very hard to appeal to the ego of many college professors and to get them to go along with a line of preaching collectivism. Now, you must understand that uh, these ideas of centralization of power with government have never been aimed at really helping the underclass, although that's how you sell it to the people. It has really been aimed at enslaving the underclass and bringing them under government control. Uh, basically, uh, what socialism is really all about, stripped of all, all of its idealism, a sincere, benevolent, idealistic theory. Socialism is force. I think de Tocqueville said it best, uh, speaking to the French Assembly many years ago, when he said that democracy and, and socialism have only one thing in common, that is a word, and that word is equality. But democracy creates uh, equality by freedom and by liberty, and whereas socialism creates equality um, by regulation and regimentation and force. And that's what it's really all about. Uh, socialism is basically a means by which a massive bureaucracy controls everything, and those who control the bureaucracy control the population. Socialism is the antithesis of freedom, and that is what the great tax-exempt foundations have been financing for almost a century in America. And the fact that you've not heard this before shows the degree of control that today exists over what the American people think. Who do you think it is today who's financing the environmental movement in America? Why the great tax-exempt foundations. Who do you, is it do you think that is financing the gay and lesbian movement, that money that's not, uh, of course, wrung out of the uh, gays and lesbians uh, appealing to their fears and telling them the, the Christians and the heterosexuals hate them? Why you, uh, if, if you have any question about that, uh, you sent us a self-addressed stamped envelope and we'll send you a copy of an article that appeared in the New York Times uh, pointing out that on our college campuses across America, you have all these crazy courses which don't prepare people for... Uh, uh, life, they prepare them for a life of perversion. Uh, the gay and lesbian studies, the women's studies, which are basically lesbian studies, the transgender studies, uh, who, who do you think is financing that? Why, the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the, uh, uh, and the Ford Foundation. Uh, uh, who do you think it is funding the abortion movement, uh, the money that doesn't come out of the public coffers? Why, it's in large part the America's great tax-exempt foundations. In fact, who do you think is funding much of the New Age activity, the occultic, uh, spiritual movement uh, which is sweeping America? 
Well, Barbara Marks Hubbard's latest book, uh, Going into the Rewriting of the Bible, was financed by the Lawrence uh, or Lawrence uh, Rockefeller Foundation. So you must understand what these great tax exempt foundations are doing. They have an objective and goal. Now, there is an interlock between the great foundations and America's uh, State Department. Let's take you back to the period immediately after the uh, Second World War, that period uh, between 1945 and about 1949, uh, 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 January of 1949, when China was lost uh, to freedom. Who, who was uh, working in the State Department? There was a man, his name was Dean Rusk, and he was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Rockefeller Foundation, a member of the Institute of uh, Pacific Relations, and the Under Secretary of State in charge of substantive affairs when we were betraying. Uh, China to the communists. And then about 1948, uh, 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 49, 1950, he became the Undersecretary of State in charge of Far Eastern Affairs, where then he could betray uh, uh, the American boys we sent to Korea to fight in a no-win United Nations-directed war, a war we never should have been in if we didn't intend to win. Uh, in fact, uh, we could talk sometime about how uh, um, um, a statement made by the American Secretary of State actually invited the North Vietnamese to attack South Vietnam, assuring them that if they did attack, we would not come to South Vietnam's aid. And, of course, the North Koreans did just what we wanted, and now we had a war going. Well, uh, Dean Rusk was the Under Secretary of State in charge of foreign affairs, uh, far eastern affairs, uh, at the time when we were betraying uh, our forces and the South Koreans. Well, then in 1952, Dwight David Eisenhower was elected to the presidency. And what happened to Dean Rusk? Why, he went to work full-time for the Rockefeller Foundation as president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And from 1952 until 1960, Dean Rusk remained president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Then in 1960, Dean Rusk returned to the American State Department, now as the American Secretary of State under John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a position he held until 1968 uh, when... um, uh, Richard Nixon was elected uh, when we supposedly changed direction in <laughs> in Washington, D.C., because now the Republicans were in. And, of course, it was during that time when we, uh, when we fought a no-win war. Exactly the same people, forces were in power uh, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, between 1960 and 1968. It had been there uh, between 1949 and 1953, 1954, the no-win war in Korea. Well, Dean Rusk then, of course, uh, was instrumental in laying out the policies which prevented our boys from winning in uh, South Vietnam. We were never allowed to hit any of the major, major targets. Uh, We literally betrayed South Vietnam to communism. Uh, We we executed their leaders. Uh, We undermined the fabric of their society. Uh, We uh, Actually, we had a program of assassination known as the Phoenix Program, where the American government paid for ears. You brought in an ear of somebody who was supposedly an enemy of the society, an enemy of the state, an enemy of America. You got well paid for an ear. I think we collected about 60,000 ears. Have you ever heard of the Phoenix Program? I bet you won't either. Uh, That's another story, and we can talk about that some evening when we talk about the background of Vietnam. Well, anyway, then, in 1968, Dean Rusk left the State Department, and uh, where do you think he went? Why, he went back to the Rockefeller Foundation to become its president once again. You see, those people uh, who uh, uh, do the service and work for the great foundations are well rewarded. Uh, whether they're actually working for the foundations or whether they're in the American State Department. Another case in point, probably the other major figure in our involvement in South Vietnam was a man named McGeorge Bundy. Uh, And, of course, his brother was married to uh, Dean Acheson's daughter. Dean Acheson had been Secretary of State at the time we betrayed uh, China and and South Korea. But McGeorge Bundy was the chairman, the director of the National Security Council between 19... Uh, 60 and about 1966, I think that's when he left the government. And, and where do you think he went to work? He became the president of the Ford Foundation. So you see this continuing uh, interlock between the great foundations in America's foreign policy, the American State Department. Uh, it really doesn't matter whether you have the Democrats in power, whether you have the Republicans in power, the foundations and their interlock with the Council on Foreign Relations, always persists. Now, if you doubt very much that there is such an interlock, I'd like to suggest that you go not to uh, a right-winger like Barry Goldwater, who will tell you that in his book, No Apologies, but go to Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Certainly no one will ever accuse Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. of either being a patriot or being a conservative. Uh, But in his book, A a Thousand Days, the story of JFK and the White House, he will tell you quite clearly, and you can index read this on the Council on Foreign Relations of the book, he will tell you that there is an establishment in America. 
It's made up of people of great wealth, and it ties into the financial and legal establishment in New York. It is known as the American establishment. Its vehicles are the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, and the Council on Foreign Relations, and its media outlets are the New York Times and Foreign Affairs Magazine. I'm quoting almost verbatim from Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. From a thousand days, you can get it at the library. It's a classic book. You see, there really is a secret establishment out there. It does have an agenda. And if you read the book, Foundations, Their Power and Influence, you'll find out how they have undermined every aspect of life, how it was the Rockefeller Foundation that financed the Kinsey Report, a terribly flawed pseudoscientific study aimed at changing the sexual mores of our society. And basically, uh, of course, the Kinsey Report then uh, acted as the impetus for Hugh Hefner and others to say, well, look, 10% uh, of the population is homosexual. Everybody's being promiscuous. Uh, why not just go ahead and do it? Look what you're uh, uh, missing out on. Uh, bestiality is really just simply a deviation of normal. And pedophilia, well, you know, there's nothing really wrong with it as far as child um, molestation. The only real problem is the parents get so upset about it. But think of the wonderful experience it is for the child as he begins to realize his sexuality. And these were the ideas that were being put forward uh, with your tax-exempt dollars in the Kinsey Report, financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. Well, you need to get hold of a copy of the book, Foundations, Their Power and Influence. But then you need to, in just in a couple of minutes, uh, you're going to hear this wonderful interview uh, that comes from the past. Now, Norman Dodd uh, was a fascinating gentleman. He was kind enough to, uh, without ever having met me, uh, to come to uh, Greenville, South Carolina, where we did a filmed interview with him uh, in 1980. And I spent uh, several evenings with him. I subsequently went to his home in Virginia, and we talked for many hours. Norman Dodd was an old line patriot. He loved America. He loved everything America stood for. He loved our freedom. And he had had that unique opportunity uh, in 1953 and 1954 to be the director of research uh, for the uh, Reese Committee. And in that position, he had an opportunity to meet Rowan Gaither, uh, the head of the Ford Foundation. And the head of the Ford Foundation uh, at one point said, um, um, Mr. Dodd, you know, why are you investigating uh, uh, the Ford Foundation? Why does Congress want to investigate the Ford Foundation? And uh, before Mr. Dodd could answer that question, Rowan Gaither said, well, uh, uh, let me tell you what our real purpose is. Uh, we are operating under presidential directives, and we're using our grant-making power to so alter the life of the United in the United States that one day we can be peacefully merged with the Soviet Union. Incredible? Not incredible at all. When did you hear this story uh, from uh, Norman Dodd's own, own lips? Now, he told this story many times across America, but it never was recorded. It never was filmed. And we did the first filmed interview ever done with him. Subsequently, our good friend uh, Ed Griffin, who's written that wonderful book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, went and, and actually um, did another filmed interview, which he's been selling for a number of years. And uh, hopefully one day we'll have our video uh, presentation ready. But it's vitally important that you hear what Mr. Dodd said. Now, Norman Dodd died in the mid-1980s. Uh, the uh, copies of the Reese Committee report were all systematically bought up, and most of them have been destroyed. We've been trying to get copies of that report. You know, you can't find one in California. You can't find one in the western United States. In fact, at East Tennessee State University, uh, where the papers of Congressman B. Carroll Reese are kept, there's no copy of the Reese Committee report, his most important work. What happened? Why, the copies of the Reese Committee port report were simply uh, bought up and destroyed. We have a taped interview with a Mr. Robert Goldsboro, who worked for a different congressional committee, but was fascinated by this subject. He was also a friend of Norman Dodd's. And in a taped interview, which we have, which incidentally is available from Radio Liberty, Mr. Goldsboro tells how uh, he had a copy of both the Cox and Reese Committee reports. And back in 1958 or so, somebody came to a complete stranger and said, I understand you have copies of those reports. I want to buy them. I'll give you $2,000. Well, now, back in those days, $2,000 was a lot of money. And, uh, but uh, Goldsboro said they're not for sale. And the stranger said, uh, I, I want those reports. You name your price. And that's what really happened across America. Most of the copies of those reports were simply bought up and are no longer available anywhere in America. Mr. Goldsboro tells me he knows of only three copies of those reports in existence in America today. There is one back at the Library of Congress. We've been able, unable to access it. But almost as good as the Reese Committee report itself is the book, Foundations, Their Power and Influence. And so it is that uh, this evening um, we're going to give you that unique opportunity to uh, listen to Mr. Norman Dodd.
as he uh, gives you the background of his wealth of information, actually working as the chief investigator for the Reese Committee. And so, in just a moment, Mr. Norman Dodd. presents an interview with Norman Dodd. The audio tape you're about to hear has been made from classic film footage produced by Dr. Stanley Monteith in 1980. This may be one of the most fascinating and important interviews you'll ever listen to. Let's join Dr. Stan as his conversation with Norman Dodd begins. Twenty-seven years ago, the Congress of the United States authorized the formation of a Congressional Investigating Committee to try to analyze the functions of the great foundations in America, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. Mr. Norman Dodd was the director of research for the Congressional Committee that came to be known as the Reese Committee. Mr. Dodd is an economist... He's the uh, consultant as far as investment is concerned. But during that period, that very important period some 27 years ago, he headed research in the effort to find out what indeed were the great foundations doing in America. Mr. Dodd, what did you find out was the stated objective and goals of the great American foundations? We found out, Doctor, that these foundations had as their objective the orientation of the people of this country to the idea of collectivism and uh, thereby nullifying for good and all of the commitment of the country to individualism, which was the feature of the country at the beginning. Now, how did they go about doing this? Well, primarily they did it, Doctor, by... Uh, by uh, securing control of what is known as the money supply of the people of this country. You're speaking now of the money supply that was going into education. Well, it's the money supply of the, of the people of the country as a whole. And how did they do this? They did this by working out a system of banking, which was foreign in this concept, but it enabled it, debt to be what we call monetized, transformed into bank deposits. Now, how did they specifically set out to influence education in America? Why, by, by having at their disposal unlimited quantities of this newly created money and being able to reward uh, the personalities who were active in the world of education, administratively as well as academically. Were they able to influence the textbooks or the teachers? Yes, they were. They were able to see that textbooks were almost produced by on order and assuring the publishers of textbooks of the funds necessary to make the publication of those books profitable. Now, have you personally had contact with some of the directors of these great foundations? Yes, I have. Could you tell us about it? Well, one instance, I'll use a, a couple of uh, instances as, as illustrations. One instance had to do with my responding to an invitation from the president of the Ford Foundation, who asked me if, when I was next in New York, would I stop in their office and have a visit, which I did. And on arrival, after amenities... Mr. Gaither, who was the then president, said, Mr. Dodd, we invited you to come and see us this morning, hoping that you would 
off the record tell us why the Congress was interested in operations of foundations such as ours. And before I could think of how I would reply to him, he volunteered the following. He said, Mr. Dodd, those of us here at the policy-making level have all had experience, either with the OSS or the European Economic Administration, in operating under directives, the origin of which was the White House. We today operate under just such directives. Would you like to know what the substance of these directives is? And I said, yes, Mr. Gator, I'd like very much to know. Whereupon he said to me, the substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. <coughs> well, figuratively, I nearly fell off the chair. But I did remark to him, <coughs> Mr. Grather, in the light of what you just told me, many of your grants make sense. I can understand them. But I do not think you're entitled to withhold this information from the people of this country to whom you are beholden for your tax exemption. So why don't you tell them what you've told me? And his answer was, Mr. Dodd, we wouldn't think of doing that. So I said, well, Mr. Gaither, answer your first question. You forced the Congress of the United States to spend $150,000 to find out what you've just told me. And so they've been pushing socialism in America ever since. Well, then, in the light of that, of course, you see... It, conditions develop, and of course you then can add and ascribe the development of these conditions and the events that accompany to this policy, because it's only in the light of that policy that these events and, and effects make any sense. And this is how, this is how, and this is their problem, Doctor. They cannot avoid having effects result from the grants that they make. They cannot avoid it. Therefore, those of, of, of this, in this country who would be concerned with what are they up to merely has to look at the effects and work back and compare the effects of a grant with the explanation of the grant in the first place. I mean, I'll just use as, as an instance to clarify the matter. You will remember there was a time when the Federal Reserve System was installed in this country by the Congress. In other words, it was legalized. And there had, it had been preceded by a long period of years and a struggle to get the Federal Reserve approved. Finally, it was approved, and the argument that swung it, swung the approval in that direction, was that if the system is installed, the result will be the elimination of bank failures. And in as much as there had been in those days uh, a plethora of bank failures, this was held up as a very bene beneficial development, practice, Cent what they call fractional reserve central banking. But nobody goes back, this was in 1912, nobody goes back to 1930 when every bank in the United States was closed. Every bank. There wasn't a solvent bank in the United States. That, you see, was proof that the original purpose was in no sense to eliminate bank failures. And this 
discrepancy and these contrasts and these contradictions are the telltale part that the those who have imposed these practices on us as a people are scared to death that it's going to be picked up and stressed and taught and so forth and so on. But it isn't. No, and the mass media doesn't already talk about no, it. No, but it neither does the educational world. This is what has to, this is what will meet the challenge. One accredited educational institution with trustees who openly declare that we notice this. We notice the inconsistency, the contradictions, and we are setting forth an effort to account for them. And that, in my opinion, would explode the whole, oh, the whole network. And they have told me that this is what they're scared to death. Somebody is going to pick up this string. Mr. Dodd, what do you think is the basic crux of this whole problem? Well, Doctor, I feel that the problem itself originates uh, with that aspect of human life which condemns men collectively to experience what is known as the fall of man. And that subsequently Christ became into the world with the, the, in, with the knowledge that the individual could confront this condition and um, not become victimized by it, but that th that uh, that entailed the individual emulating Christ, who, who through the temptations in the wilderness was confronted by the satanic, listened to what the satanic had to offer, and say no, and then add, and I know you to be Satan, and Satan went away. That, to me, is the clue to how to nullify this um, influence which has had humanity in its grip for centuries. Well, <clears throat> of course, what it means is that one has to accept the realism of the inclusion of evil. And that, in turn, challenges the world of education to equip the, 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 the student with the knowledge necessary to recognize evil in action in, within the sphere of his own experiences and refuse to be part of it. Then this influence which has been behind the creation of this network can operate. It cannot operate in the light. And admittedly, it, you know, says that it acknowledges that so that it is, it is those who are part of it knowingly are scared to death that somebody at some point, as they put it, they're going to pick up the end of a string and little by little follow it to the end. And as they put it to me, when that happens, we're through. Now, did you or any member of your staff ever have the opportunity of going through the records of any of the great foundations? Well, we had one remarkable instance of that kind, by in, again, by invitation. This invitation came from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and was in response to a letter which I had written to the endowment asking certain questions, seeking certain information. And this invitation was issued to me over the telephone to come to their office in New York when I was next there. This I did. And on arrival, found myself in the presence of the, Dr. Joseph Johnson, the president, 
two vice presidents and their own counsel, a partner of Sullivan and Cromwell. And after a minute, these Dr. Johnson said, Mr. Dodd, we received your letter, and we can answer all these questions, but that w it will be a great deal of trouble because with the uh, approval of, by the Senate, a ratification of the United Nations Treaty, we felt our job was done. So we took all our records from the beginning of this endowment up to that 1945 <coughs> and sent them to the warehouse. And then we con concentrated on just using our funds to build this new building across the street from the United Nations which would provide the various organizations that would follow the United Nations activities with a place to meet. But, he said, we have a counter-suggestion, and that is, Mr. Dodd, if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send them to New York, we will provide that member with a room in the library, our library, and the minute books of this endowment since its inception. And we think whatever you want to find out, you can find out through that source. Well, my first reaction was these men had lost their mind because I had a pretty good idea of what those minute books might show up. But as I thought about it, I realized that most of them were new in their position. And my guess was none of them had ever read the minutes themselves, which would be, of course, quite a task to cover 50 years of minutes, you know, reading. Certainly. I accepted this invitation and selected a, a member of my staff, a Miss Catherine Casey, who was a pr practicing Washington lawyer but who was on my staff to see to it that I, in conduct of the work of the staff, did not break any official rules in Washington. Catherine was also unsympathetic to the investigation. Her attitude was, uh, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, I went out of my way not to prejudice her, but I did say that, Catherine, when you get to New York, you'll find that you can't possibly cover 50 years of minutes in two weeks. So you'll have to do what we call spot reading. And I blocked out certain periods for her to concentrate on. And when she returned to Was from Washington, her eyes were figuratively as big around as saucers, and she brought back to me the following on dictaphone belts. We're back in 1908, and the trustees meet, and they raise this question among themselves, namely, is there any means beside war known to man more capable assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people. Now these are the trustees of the Carnegie That's Foundation. Right. And they discussed this question in a very learned fashion for approximately a year and come up with the conclusion that war is the most effective means known to man assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people. So then they bring up a second question, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? And I doubt if in 1909 there was any subject more removed from the minds of us as a people than our involvement in a war. There were shows going on in the Balkans, <laughs> 
and most of the people of this country hardly knew where the Balkans were. And they conclude that they must control the diplomatic machinery of the United States. And that raises question number three, namely, how do we secure that control? And the answer comes up, we must control the State Department. And there, from that time on, their activities were centered on securing control of the State Department. Now, as a means to that end, the endowment founded an instrumentality called the Council for Learned Societies. And that council was assigned the task of passing on every high official appointment to the State Department before the appointment was confirmed. At that point, this finding linked up with what we had already suspected, but nevertheless, here was confirmation of it. Well, this happened, <clears throat> and pretty soon this, the country was in a war, which came to be known, of course, as World War I. And this group of trustees at one point congratulated themselves on the wisdom of their original decision because, as they put it, war has demonstrated a power to alter the life of the people of this country already. And then their interest centered on seeing to it that we as a people did not revert to our customs and our practices which prevailed prior to the outbreak of World War I. And they decided after the war was over that that meant we had to control education in the United States. And so they realized that this was a very prodigious task. So they, they approached the Rockefeller Foundation and made the suggestion that the Rockefeller Foundation take on half the problem and they retain the other half. They divided it between those subjects which were domestic in their significance and those which were international. And <clears throat> they together, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Endowment, decided that the crux of the matter lay in their ability to alter the teaching of American history in this country. So they approached the then three of the most prominent historians with that suggestion, and they were turned down flat. So then they decided they'd have to build their own stable of historians. And so they then approached the Guggenheim Foundation, which specialized in awarding fellowships, and said figuratively, when we find the likely young man who's headed to become a teacher of American history and will you grant him on our say-so a fellowship? And the answer was, yes, we will. So they gradually assembled 20. And they took these 20 to England, London. And there they briefed them as to what was expected of them. And that became the nucleus of the American Historical Association to which, ultimately, the endowment made a grant of $400,000 for a study to be made which would conclude what the future of this country was to be. And at the end of 1932, 
This study comes out in seven volumes, the last volume of which was a summary of the other six. And it ended on the note that the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. And that became the, as it, I'm using today's language, that became the guidelines for higher education in this country. And then coincidentally with that, then books began to appear all of which were uh, detrimental to our vision of our own patriots who had signed a Declaration of Independence, and they were downgrading these men. Witness the last, most recent book on Jefferson that had to do with his having a, enjoyed a colored mistress and things like that. But there's no reason to write that sort of thing. You know, were many of these books that have come out through the years funded, financed, subsidized by the great foundations? Through the medium of their uh, support of public, certain publishing companies, yes. Did the mass media in, in the 1950s adequate, adequately cover the findings of the Reese Committee? Oh, no. No. Was there any effort? Uh, most, uh, most reaction... Through the through the media were casting were aimed at criticism of me as a personality and well, that and let it go at that. Well, certainly when the book The Foundations, Their Power and Their Influence came out, this was basically a book that covered the background of the findings of the Reese Committee. Did this book get any coverage as far as book reviews? Was it uh, widely circulated? No. Did the public have an opportunity to find out what the great foundations were really doing? No, this book circularized or became circularized through the medium of what we refer to as the conservatives in this country. So it was, in a sense, um, a cor corroboration of what motivates the conservatives in this country. And they all had this book, and that's all there was to it. And this discrepancy and these contrasts and these contradictions are the telltale part that the those who have imposed these practices on us as a people are scared to death that it's going to be picked up and stressed and taught and so forth and so on. But it isn't. And so Norman Dodd reveals in an interview from 1980 the fact that education is what shines the light of truth on sinister forces. Here at Radio Liberty, we strive to make educational materials available to you. Please write us with your request for a copy of the Radio Liberty resource brochure. It will be our pleasure to get it to you free and postpaid. You can write us at Post Office Box 13, Santa Cruz, California, 95063. If you prefer, you can call us anytime to make your request known. The number to use is 1-800-5-HIV-WAR. That's 800-544-8927. Thank you for helping us shine the light.